Today's sponsor is Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker provides you with a personalized exercise, nutrition, and supplementation plan to optimize your health. Claim your 20% discount at insidetracker.com slash new scientist. Hello, welcome to New Scientist Weekly. I'm Rowan Hooper. And I'm Penny Sarche. Welcome to the show. This week, we're joined in London by Jacob Aaron and from New York by Carmela Padovich Callahan and Corinne Wetzel. Hello, all. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, all. Uh, and on the show this week, we've got time loops. We've got the fifth wave of COVID. We have a, a very hawkish life form of the week. And we're hearing about a couple of court cases brought against companies by climate litigation firm Client Earth. All very interesting indeed, but mm. we're going to start with physics and the Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, the LHC has just started run three, which is the third period of operation, and it's smashing protons together at 13.6 tera electron volts, which doesn't that sound fancy? <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, it's the highest energy any collider has ever achieved. So come on, let's big that up. Woo. Woo. -woo. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we'll come back later to what that means and what it's going to be looking for. But by coincidence, run three of the LHC comes 10 years almost to the day that the announcement went out that the Higgs boson had been discovered. And we all remember that, or some of us uh, here today remember that well, all the anticipation and the rumours, and then finally the confirmation of the discovery. Jacob, you were in the newsroom at the time. Remind us why it was such a big story and, and actually what the Higgs is. Yeah, so I, I remember, as you say, it was really exciting at the time that this this breakthrough that people have been waiting for for a long time was finally announced. Um, as for why the Higgs is uh, important, it, it's often said that the Higgs boson gives mass to all other particles. That's actually yeah. not quite right. Um, technically, oh. <laughs> the particle mediates the interactions of the Higgs field, which is something that permeates the entire universe, and that's what gives particles mass. But, <sighs> you know, we kind of just say, oh, it's the boson, and then sort of chuck the the difficult bits under the rug so we don't have to get into the complicated stuff yeah the other reason we talk about the boson rather than the field is that we can actually detect it and that's what the large hadron collider did a decade ago uh, announcing on 4th of july um, 2012 and confirming a theory that was dreamt up by peter higgs and others uh, long ago in the 1960s yeah and that's why there's been big celebrations ever since um but there's talk of a hangover isn't there and what why is that and and can we cure it by, you know, flying around at 13.6 tera electron volts? Yes, particle physicists got their Higgs hangover, you know, after making this fantastic discovery and then sitting back, clearing away the champagne bottles and thinking, actually, this Higgs is a bit boring. <laughs> I mean, what, why are they saying it's boring? They've made well, it. Well, you know, I mean, maybe, 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 maybe boring is unfair, but it's it's boring in the sense that it appeared to be exactly as Peter Higgs had predicted um, so long ago. It was the last undiscovered particle theorized as part of the standard model of particle physics, which is our best understanding of all the particles in the universe. But the standard model is incomplete. It says nothing about gravity, for example. So physicists have been hoping to get Higgs with a twist, something that would just be a, a little nugget, a little clue for extending the standard model. So it's a bit like they built this huge expensive machine and then they discovered exactly what they were expecting to discover. Yeah, which is pretty impressive if you consider, yeah. you know, Peter Higgs sitting there at his blackboard in the 1960s with essentially just maths and making making an accurate prediction that we only were able to discover with the LHC. So, but despite all that, they, there was hope of finding a whole new zoo of particles uh, predicted by supersymmetry, wasn't there? Yes, so supersymmetry is this uh, much beloved theory, or much beloved by by some physicists, I should say, uh, a way of extending the standard model by giving each particle a heavier companion called a superparticle or sparticle, if you want to get fancy. Uh, and the you know the maths again, it's lovely, elegant. Everyone loves symmetry, especially if you're a physicist. But there isn't actually a shred of evidence uh, that supersymmetry has anything to do with the real universe outside of the lovely maths. And increasingly, physicists are, are turning away from symmetry, saying, oh, you know, even though it's such a lovely theory, maybe we should look for something that actually is relevant to the real world. Although they do get cross when I call it fan fiction for the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. So what's replaced it then? 
Well, um, nothing really. Uh, there have been lots and lots and lots of new theories. Uh, you know, occasionally there's been a hint of exciting new data coming out from the LHC that might possibly mean something, a new discovery, and ultimately just ends up being nothing but a statistical blip. But yes, as you say, you know, we're now into run three and we're going to get a lot more data and maybe something will show up. And when we were chatting about this, you were saying, or you're speculating that the Higgs might be peak LHC. Would there be a new glory to come? I mean, my instinct, you know, blind instinct would be there is new glory to come. But what do you think? I think we're not going to get anything of the significance of the Higgs out of the LHC. You know, it was a machine Mm. essentially built to discover the Higgs. Of course, it could do other things. Uh, Just this week, um, experiments at CERN announced discoveries of new tetraquarks and uh, pentaquarks, which are arrangements of three and five quarks, which are slightly unusual, but, you know, not massively useful if you're trying to come up with an entirely new theory of how the universe works Uh, so to have something that big really I think eventually we're going to be looking at do we spend you know another however many more billions on a new even bigger collider I should say, um, you know, most physicists would disagree and say there's lots more to come from the LHC uh, and, uh, you know, lots lots to look for. But, you know, I kind of feel that they would say that. So, And I guess one thing they're going to be looking at is the W boson. This is another kind of boson. And we talked about it on episode 113, actually. So remind us about that. So yes, the W boson is another important uh, particle from the the standard model. And the discovery earlier this year was from the the Tevatron, uh, a now uh, defunct particle accelerator in the US. They spent 10 years analyzing their data. And finally, we're pretty confident in saying, hang on, we've got a measurement that is not as the standard model predicts. So exactly what you want if you're looking to open up that gap look for new hints. The trouble is that um, although their measurement was very precise and and it was different from the standard model, we have lots of existing measurements that do agree with the standard model. So the question is, is there something spurious going on there? The LHC will be able to look at this. It will be able to get new data on the W boson and we might be able to get an answer on, on that question. Obviously, we're hoping that, you know, the mass of the W boson doesn't differ across the Atlantic, which I know some physicists have, have joked about uh, from getting different results from the US and, and Europe. But we, we will have to wait and see. My last thing to say about this is that I just discovered that bosons are named after the Indian physicist Satyendra Nath Bose, who I've heard of, obviously, from Bose-Einstein condensates, things like that. But I didn't know that um, bosons were named after him. So that's nice. Yeah, uh, bosons uh, and fermions are sort of the other important class of particles and obviously uh, named after physicist Enrico Fermi. There's um, much more about the future of the Large Hadron Collider in our feature article this week by particle physicist Harry Cliff. Um, So we'll put a link to that in our show notes. Now it's time for Life Form of the Week. So Corin, what have you got for us this week? So this week we've got a big predatory raptor called a Harris's hawk. Oh, they're re- I've seen a few of those. They, they're they often used for sort of falconry in the UK, I think. Um, wh- mm-hmm. What in particular are, are you telling us about them? Well, first, what I've got to tell you is that the birds used in this study, um, these four hawks were named after dragons. So we've got Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon and Drogon and Rhaegal after the dragons from Game of Thrones. And then we've got a fourth bird named Ruby. Is Ruby a dragon? I, that's a great question. It feels uh, random for them to suddenly go off theme, but... Um, Smaug, they could have had. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> I wonder if they're open to suggestions. Putting the names aside, what have they? <laughs> why are they in the news? Yeah, so scientists have been really curious to find out how large birds like Harris's hawks manage to land on branches without crashing. So smaller birds will flap their wings and hover to slow down and then sort of drop onto a perch. But these hawks weigh too much to to pull that off. So instead, just before landing, these birds do a dramatic swoop, which you can imagine the bird just dipping down right before a perch and then spreading its wings out wide before landing. Mm, Yeah, I can I can picture that. Yeah, so to get a better idea about how this swoop works, researchers filmed the birds flying and perching in slow motion. So the hawks were wearing these special reflective backpacks and had these little markings on their wings and tails so that the cameras could pick up each precise movement and then translate them into a 3D computer model. 
uh, I'm just stuck on backpacks, Corinne, because you were talking about rats wearing backpacks last time. Is this your beat now? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Animals just wearing lots, backpacks. Lots of tiny backpacks. Get ready, yeah. Rowan. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, go on. So the computer model revealed the nuances of the bird's swooping behavior. So as they get near a branch, the birds dive down and then they spread their wings wide to launch themselves upward. And then once they're in the stalled position, the hawks can reach out and grasp a branch with their feet without making a total mess of the landing. What about that did we not know before? Does that sort of change our understanding of how these birds land? Yeah, so what's really most interesting about um, this study is that they found that the swooping process, uh, it wastes time and energy, but it is a worthwhile sacrifice to ensure a safe landing. So it's particularly intriguing that the hawks would do a behavior or that any animal would do a behavior that wastes time and energy. But if it means having a disastrous crash landing, <laughs> it's a worthwhile exchange, I think. And then the work, this work with hawks could also help improve flying robots like drones, which have often struggled to master perching, um, that transition from flying quickly to, to perching in a tree. Let's take a break to tell you about our next online event taking place on Thursday, the 14th of July with physicist Will Kinney. Yeah, Will is going to be talking about the Big Bang, the explosion almost 14 billion years ago from which all matter in the universe emerged, and asking classic questions like, why is the universe so big and what's the origin of structure in the cosmos? Will Kinney will be explaining a recent theory that may hold the answers to these questions. Go to newscientist.com slash universe origin to find out more and book tickets. Now, we've got another throwback, actually, to episode 113 of the podcast, in which we reported on the latest IPCC report. And one aspect we picked out was the growing use of litigation to hold governments and corporations to account over their net zero plans. Yeah, and there is a lot of this going on. Uh, just last week, a case was brought against the Dutch airline KLM for greenwashing. And earlier this year, against the French oil giant Total Energies, or I should say Total Energy, uh, both were brought by the environmental legal organisation Client Earth, and I spoke with their chief impact officer, also known as head of greenwashing, Maria Christina Duval. And I asked Maria first if she could summarise what Client Earth does. We are essentially working on every area of the environment to protect it, either by contributing to the drafting of laws, such as the common fisheries policy at the EU level, or by prosecuting governments or corporations as we are going to talk about today for greenwashing, but also for a series of other wrongs or lack of enforcement. We also bring a lot of corporations to the attention of regulators. And I'm sure that today we will be talking about the role of regulators in greenwashing and, and in policing greenwashing. I think that that's a very important role that, that the public sector has to play in this transition. We are essentially lawyers who work for the planet and we base all of our work on science. Now, your chief impact officer at Client Earth, but Informally, you're head of greenwashing, and uh, that's the case that you, <laughs> well, that's the case you've just filed against the Dutch airline KLM, isn't it? So, can you tell us about that? So, we have been partnering with an organization of Dutch campaigners called Fossil Free, and that is to essentially challenge KLM's um, breach under Dutch consumer law, the transposition of a European directive that is called the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. As you may know, within the EU, a lot of laws are crafted at the EU level, but then they need to be implemented at the national level. Right. And in this case, is the, this is the Dutch implementation of um, that regulation. And that regulation is really there to protect consumers from misleading advertising at large. And what we are assessing is, uh, what we are alleging, sorry, is that um, KLM's advertising, its Fly Responsibly campaign, misleads consumers on the role that flying has in climate change, contributing to climate change, as well as the, they make a promise about carbon offsets, reducing the impact of flying. And we essentially disagree with both of those tenets of the advertising campaign. By bringing a court case in the Netherlands, we are hoping that the court will agree with us and will ask KLM to ban the advertising and to um, essentially publish a rectification of what it has been alleging through this campaign. Okay, so I was going to ask what the best case outcome is. And it's not that they have to, you know, ground their planes or anything like that. Uh, they just have to stop stop this greenwashing. Absolutely. This is yeah. essentially really about misleading consumers and customers yeah. more than it is on the, I mean, there, you know, there is, we do have issues with the, the companies themselves and the way that they do business. But here it's really what we're um, trying to 
make consumers aware of is that they're being misled by yeah. airlines, by fossil fuel companies. So essentially what we would like to see is for the Dutch court to rule to have that campaign completely withdrawn by the company. More broadly, I would say we would like to see in Europe an end to fossil fuel advertising broadly, the same way we saw years ago about tobacco, and that would include advertising from the aviation industry. Okay, now let's turn to Total Energies. Tell us who they are, first of all, in case people haven't heard of them and, and what the charge is against them. So Total Energy, um, is, it's true, is very well known in France and it's very well known in Africa because of a lot of the operations that it's led for a long time there, but may not be as well known in the UK. Right. It is France's largest fossil fuel company. And in fact, it produces more greenhouse gas emissions than France does as a country. Wow. So it's, um, it's a company that is invested very, very heavily in the fossil fuel industry, but also what it is actually doing at the moment is continuing to plan for more growth, more expansion and exploration of fossil fuel around the world, actually. At the same time as it is doing that, it is essentially alleging that it will be net zero by 2050. And that is blatant greenwashing. It's misleading consumers around the world about the nature of its operations and the nature of its impact. So there, what we have done, and this goes back to the point I made earlier about uh, partnerships, is we've partnered with Greenpeace France, Friends of the Earth, and Notre Affaire à Tous in order to bring a greenwashing claim in France under the same directive that we brought it against for the Netherlands with KLM. And here it's under the implementation, the French implementation of the directive. So it's all about the meaning of net zero. I can see how stopping greenwashing is a really important thing to do. But is there a way that we can or that you can be even more ambitious and try and stop them actually, you know, for example, stopping Total Energies extracting more fossil fuels, you know, stop them emitting as much? Is there a way of going after that in a, in a much stronger way? There is. And I think that what we do is that we take a multi-pronged approach because we know that the fight is a huge one. We know that corporates are way behind in the transition. We are at the moment in England bringing a case against the directors of Shell and that is not on greenwashing. It's on Shell's own plans to transition to net zero as a company. We are bringing that claim as shareholders of the company against the board of directors of the company. We believe that the directors full well know what kinds of impacts Shell is having on the environment and the fact that it, as it continues to grow and as it continues to expand its operations, it is not going towards net zero. It is, in fact, planning to grow. And that that's the responsibility of the directors if they want, as they should and as they are obligated to under law, to protect the success of the company. That's essentially their fiduciary duty. They cannot at the same time plan for expansion and publish net zero plans as they did last year at the AGM that really don't stack up from an evidentiary point of view. So that's another way that's you know very powerful in a different way to go directly after directors as individuals who are responsible for the stewarding of the company. But I should say, I find that greenwashing is also incredibly important um, from a consumer perspective because it enables consumers as a whole, and it's a, such a, a large group of people, obviously, in our countries to understand generally that they're being misled and to interrogate more and more what corporates are telling them literally on a daily basis. It could mm. be HSBC ads at a bus stop in London, which we see all the time, um, Starbucks and others who are literally misleading us on a daily basis. And until actually quite recently, consumers were not aware that they were being misled on environmental claims. I wanted to ask you about the the recent US Supreme Court ruling um, against the Environmental Protection Agency that will limit the EPA's ability to regulate emissions in the US. But that's a legal challenge going the wrong way from our point of view, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And it and I guess it goes to show, as we've known for a long time, that um, the Supreme Court of the United States being so politically charged has the ability to reach these kinds of decisions. I think for us as an organization, because we use a lot of corporate and finance law tools, we just see this as a message to us to continue fighting on those grounds. I think it's fair to say that governments and judges come and go, but corporate law remains. Corporate law can be an incredibly powerful tool in order to go after corporations and to hold them accountable. And so we will be focusing our efforts on doing that in our growing area of work in North America, because as you've pointed out, <laughs> the Supreme Court is not stacked in our favor at the moment. Mm. 
That was Maria Cristina Duval of Client Earth. And I should say, I asked KLM and Total Energies for a response, but they didn't reply. But KLM has made a statement publicly saying it would certainly not be in our interest to misinform our customers. It's our responsibility to make future travel as sustainable as possible. We believe our communications comply with the applicable legislation and regulations. And Total has also made a public statement saying it was implementing its climate strategy and reducing its greenhouse gas emissions and was acting in line with the objectives that the company has set itself. It's therefore wrong to claim that our strategy is greenwashing. Well, that's the welcome sound of the sci-fi alert, which is Rowan's excuse for shoehorning something from science fiction into yeah. a sto- story that's currently in the news. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one this week, though. We've got a story about research into something called causal loops, and that really does sound like time travel. Um, but it comes from a physics journal rather than from a TV show or something. So, Carmela, what do causal loops have to do with time travel? So causal loops are the kind of paradoxes that could happen if we were able to travel to the past and then mess with it. So for instance, if I read Erwin Schrodinger's famous 1935 paper about the dead and alive cat, and then I time traveled a year further to 1934, and I told Schrodinger all about it as if it had been my idea, that would have been a causal loop. The problem is clearly <laughs> the problem is clearly that I didn't come up with a cat, and Schrodinger didn't come up with a cat, but we both used it to influence each other. Um, amazing. A, a brilliant example. Thank you. <laughs> so the new research you've reported on, does that have a way of saying that this is actually possible? Can such a loop happen? Well, yes and no. The researchers studied a very large set of theoretical universes, and they did find that some of them can allow for causal loops. But a lot of those same universes, which are all theoretical, would still forbid you from sending an actual message into the past. <laughs> wow. So what does it mean that the universe can, or a universe can allow this? What sort of changes in the laws of physics do we need? Right. So maybe we should pull back a little bit and say that in general, physicists think that to influence the past, you have to send messages or travel faster than the speed of light. This new research shows that that's not quite true. So in the Schrodinger example, you wouldn't actually have to go and meet him or call him on some faster than life time phone or somehow put the cat idea into his head. The big focus of this research is really whether information can be causally related in time without there being any faster than life communication. Oh, uh, this is this is what we're here for, this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how how are they working on this kind of totally unintuitive madness? Yeah, so so let's try and do do a, a, an analogy where you test a bunch of cakes. So instead okay. of making a bunch of cakes, they had to make a bunch of universes. So they started with some minimal ingredients. This is your like sugar, flour, and liquids. And they didn't assume anything else. So no like raisins or chocolate chips or mixings or anything like that. And then they looked at whether causal loops are allowed with these minimal ingredients. So sort of like if you chuck this in the oven, how many of your cakes are going to rise? <laughs> and in the analogy, like they thought that faster than light communication would be like baking soda, like the only thing that would make it rise. For this research, the minimal ingredients were just people that can receive and act on information and the restriction that these people can't do any of this information manipulation faster than light. And they were surprised by how many cases with these minimal ingredients actually did allow for causal loops. So in this analogy, more cakes rose than they actually expected. So um, I guess the question is, are we living in a rising cake? (laughs) (laughs) Well, right now, it seems very likely that we are not. Um, Our actual universe does share some of these minimal ingredients with many of these theoretical worlds. But luckily, we may just be way, way too big to get caught up in the causal loops. Uh, The researcher I spoke to explained that there are a lot more causal loops in universes with one spatial dimension. And as far as we know, we live in three spatial dimensions, so we should be fine. Oh, phew. I'm glad glad to hear it. And so what's the sci-fi link here? What are we going to go with? Oh, this is the Lazarus Project. Uh, it's out now on Sky in the UK. It's also available in Australia in, and New Zealand. But in the US, you're going to have to wait for it for a bit. But it's really worth waiting for. It's about a secret agency called the Lazarus Project. And they control this kind of time machine, but more like a time loop reset machine that allows them to reset the world back to July the 1st of that year if they need to because of some big world-threatening event takes place like nuclear war or pandemic 
Yeah, it's really good. It's a really smart new way to use time travel in a narrative. It's it's well recommended. So if the physicists get hold of it, they they could use it to constantly relive the the discovery of the Higgs on Fourth of July, <laughs> <laughs> and avoid the hangover. Yeah. <laughs> And next up, talking about time loops, let's talk about COVID because everyone's catching it again. Uh, Yeah, so for those keeping count, apparently this is the UK's fifth wave of COVID infections. um, And there are a lot of them out there right now. Uh, The best data we have for this suggests that around one in 30 people in England and one in 18 in Scotland had the virus in the week ending 24th of June. We get a bit of a time lag now because we have to Mm. rely on ONS numbers. So it's fair to assume that it's continued to increase since then. And we've talked about this before. These are the new, even more infectious Omicron variants, BA4 and BA5. But also the UK did remove almost all restrictions earlier this year. So, you know, we were expecting this, weren't we? Um, Although it does seem surprising that people are catching COVID so many times. Yeah, that's pretty sobering, really. Um, If you Mm. think about flu, for example, I looked up, you know, how often can you expect to catch that? And there's evidence that as an adult, you probably only catch it every five years or so. Um, But COVID reinfections seem to be much more common, especially since the Omicron variants emerge, um, because these are better at evading prior immunity from vaccination or previous infections. And it's difficult to get hard data on this because the virus is evolving all the time. But it certainly seems now that once you've had Omicron as a to say Delta, you can't really bank on having bought yourself maybe a few months protection, which definitely I think was an attitude people were having not that long ago, whereas now potentially you could get reinfected much sooner. So what do we know about, you know, so many people have already had COVID, you know, what do we know about if you have it a second, third or fourth time? Does that make any difference? So that's the unfortunate thing. And and the answer is yes. Uh, Researchers have been saying for some time, really, that every time you catch COVID, it's like rolling the dice again. To some extent, you run the risk of all the severe, longer term or or more major things that COVID can cause, um, cognitive effects, organ damage, long COVID, etc. And can we put some numbers on it and some studies? So there was this preliminary study that garnered quite a lot of interest recently. It looked at COVID infections in about 300,000 people, 40,000 of whom had had two or more infections. And the study found that people who had second or third COVID infections had significantly higher rates of things like heart disease and kidney failure in the days and months that followed. So does that mean that second and third infections are worse? Does that really mean they're worse than the first infection? No. Um, so that's what some people have sort of taken from this. That, that's not actually what that means. Um, mm. And in fact, you probably are uh, a bit less likely to have serious problems during a second or third infection as you are in a first infection. But what this study suggests is even though that may well be the case, it's still worse to have COVID multiple times overall than a single time. It's sort of an additive risk, even if the risk maybe diminishes with each infection yeah okay so I mean you hear people saying well I was fine the one time I had it so it doesn't matter if I get it again I I think that's a common misconception Uh, and I think it's fair to say too that many people think that also vaccines help here um uh, you know once you've had your vaccine maybe you've also had the infection too surely you're going to be fine And that's not the case. Quite alarming, actually, in this study, anyway. um, The data suggested that people who'd had at least one dose of vaccine before getting COVID for a second time had just the same risk of problems as people who were unvaccinated. So we need an Omicron-specific vaccine. Yeah, and there are several in the works, and some should be available in some parts of the world uh, later this year. I think it is looking that way. But, of course, there is this risk that an entirely new variant could have emerged by then. All right. I mean, I've been asking this since two and a half years ago, but what's the way out of this? So um, some of the researchers that Michael LePage spoke to when he was looking into this, uh, they were saying um, we should really be prioritising the development of more effective vaccines. For example, like maybe nasal spray vaccines would be better. Mm. And the thing that I would love to see, and I know I'm not the only one, is a a pan-coronavirus vaccine that's effective against all coronaviruses, not just COVID-19. Of course, in the meantime, we do know the things that we can do in our daily lives to reduce the likelihood of catching COVID. But in many places, the appetite for wearing masks and social distancing is now a lot lower than it used to be. Okay, thanks, Penny. And uh, that report you mentioned by Michael, um, we'll post a link to it in the show notes. It's full of all the ins and outs about that study. 
Uh, and that's it for this week. Thanks to our guests, Jacob Aaron, Carmela Padovic Callahan, and Corinne Wetzel. And thanks to you for listening. Do remember to rate our show, subscribe, and recommend it to every single one of your friends and family. <laughs> I'm Penny Sarche. And I'm Rowan Hooper. Bye for now. Take care and see you next week. Bye. 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 Hello, welcome to New Scientist Weekly. I'm Rowan Hooper. On the show this week, we've got time loops. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.